Who are the first people you want to see the finished product of the internal butler? Producers rep, distributor, sales agent, film festivals? Um, well, it really, if we, let's back it up. Let's say that we're in the process of post-production and we've just got the assembly together. Um, maybe I want myself, the director, um, and maybe one other person to see it. I don't want everybody to see the assembly because it's not going to be disappointed. Because if you know, if you've never watched, sat and watched an assembly, you just don't, you're like, well, what? <laughs> People's brains don't work well if they don't understand what they're watching with an assembly. Why isn't this? Done? They don't understand to just watch what they can see. They want to watch everything else. So, you know, then I get to that next one. Let's say now we're at the, we're at a, a cut, but not quite the fine cut but a cut where it's good enough where they've got everything in it, then maybe now all the producers can see it. Um, and maybe some of the money people can see it, maybe, depending on how happy we are. And then, you know, so really I'm waiting till the fine cut. So where it's like, just about everything is done, but maybe you're missing a title here or there, or that maybe this, maybe every, the picture's all cut, but we're still waiting for the sound. Then I maybe let people really, you know, watch it, you know, who would maybe I'd still question, but I'd still let them watch it. And then when I finally have a cut cut, then I'm probably still wanting to do some kind of test screening where I'm like at least screening it for cast and crew, right? And then at that point, if I'm, we're happy with that, then maybe I'm looking at if I'm, if it's got a theater, if it's got a distributor already, then it's got a distributor already, then you don't have to worry about it. If we're looking for distribution, then maybe I'm either going to go to a festival with a cut or I'm going to screen it for a week in LA or New York and have people and get critics to see it. If you go to the Arena Cine Lounge like we did for, was the campus, now it's Def Day, but if the campus, you get in there for a week, you automatically get a review in The Hollywood Reporter, you automatically get written up in several of the major publications, you're only talking about $2,500 anyway for a week, I think, at that place last time. I did it before pandemic, but it can't be much more than that. Um, and so, you know, or put together $5,000. Now you've got uh, the theatrical distributed film. People are going to go see it more. And then whatever deal you're going to make is going to be worth just a little bit more. Uh, and then screening-wise, if I'm done, done, then, you know, I'm going to distributor saying, you know, buy this. I guess at that point, which I know I've, I've got it as good as I can get it done. And certain uh, screening in certain cities is worth it, even if you don't break even, just for the mere appearance of yeah, it? Yeah, you think, think of it as mar it's marketing money. But by being written up, in the, the, there's no replacement before being written up and being, having a review in the newspaper, having, you know, having it being listed in a theatrical thing, and having a person, having maybe that one person who went through and was looking for a movie listing or whatever website that they were looking at and see it there because that means they're more than likely when they, maybe they don't go watch it in the theater, but when they see it in on Netflix or wherever it is, that movie stands out way more than it did if they never saw it anywhere, even if it's a Netflix title because it was someplace else that somebody else said it was worth something more than that. And that just means something to people. It still does. Theater is still the top. And we just don't have as much going to theater, so it means even more now. I don't think it's tangible, but I think it's mark. I think from a marketing side and from a prestige side, it's just it's important. I think it gives you a little that little leg up, and you can ask for a little bit more from the other side. And you'll do L.A. and New York. Yeah, I just did L.A. last time, but we uh, for Horrors of War, we did I did Ohio, L.A., and I believe they did New York as well. Was most of the cast and crew from Ohio? Um, yeah, it was all shot in Ohio. So we did an Ohio screening. We did a, we got a couple Ohio screenings, and then we did one LA screening that I was that I attended the LA screening, and then there was a, a New York screening as well. So what if you spend the twenty five hundred at a certain theater in LA? You get in some key publications, get a review, and they squash the film. All press is good press because it, especially depending on the type of movie it is or what kind of audience it's being for, for, for you can always, they, they can all, if you don't have a bad review, that's almost bad too, by the way, because then you don't have legitimate reviews. Not all reviews can be good. Somebody's got it, because that means you had enough reviews that somebody bothered to not like it. 
Because you're going to have a bunch, especially horror movies, you can get all kinds of good reviews easily, all those different websites and stuff. So, I mean, I believe if you go look up the Horrors of War, not Horrors of War, if you go look up the Death Day review in the Hollywood World, wasn't that great? But it still got written up, and it's still better than not being written up at all. They, but they bothered enough not to like it. They saw it. Think that that's like I, I think it, it, literally. I think there's almost no way to kill it on that level in the sense of like there are plenty of movies people are watching with two stars, one star on things. I personally won't watch something below three stars normally, but you know, plenty of people will watch. They want to watch something that's one star sometimes. I do. Yeah, okay, I want to so, see why. Yeah, and so and and we do have the different things like with black exploitation movies. I'm totally into. I want to see the worst ones. I want to see why this is a one star movie. Like certain historical types of movies, absolutely. I want to know historically why is this. <laughs> so yes, I mean, so that's that's it. Because at a certain point, you want to like, why is it so bad? Why are they paint it so bad? Are they mad at them? Because sometimes they're just being mean. Sure. Oh yeah. And, and I, you can do that with any review, really. And it's fascinating to see some of the the negative because yeah, there is. What's the agenda here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Once the film is complete, are you going to uh, film market? Depends on the circumstances. I've actually, you know, I've had cases where I have often sold movies before they're done and often sold them without having to go anywhere. Like, you know, like going to the festival or going to the market was like an ancillary thing. When I actually have the product and I'm putting it on the, you know, calling somebody or saying, hey, blah, 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 um, it's happening you know, mar markets are almost like for me have been like more social acti marketing activities, social activities. I haven't really gone personally with one of my films. Like Redemption was taken to a lot, taken to Cannes, was taken to um, places, you know, all of the different ones, major markets. Um, but we had pretty much already had our major distribution deal because I already made the distribution deal before then I sold it to a foreign sales agent to then go do that. So, you know, it's kind of like, okay, I didn't really feel like I needed to go that first time. I went to Cannes this next time because I was working for a production company who never finished any as much as I ever finished. And so we just kind of went and, and hung out. Um, but I love markets. I think they're very appropriate. I love festivals. I love being a part of them. I think they're an important part of the process. But I find, I think, having my background as a news guy and having worked at E! making deals all those years, and I'm really good at just picking up the phone and getting somebody to... Say, hey, take a look at this. Or, hey, <laughs> you know, this is what I've got and getting them to take a look at it. It doesn't matter about market. When people want to buy, like we said, they want to buy. It doesn't matter if it's a market or not. They want to buy it. So that's kind of what I've fashioned myself on. So I try not to gear myself too much towards it. Um, but if the timing is working in that moment, I will use it because they're, everyone's more receptive to buying at those times. It's almost like they're buy, they're buy, they're buying feed bags on. How long will you spend marketing, putting money towards promoting the film? What when when do you say okay? I think we pull the plug. On. In some level, never, because it's it's part of your library. Because you know now I'm part of a library with Jay where I'm working with that library. That's essentially forty two titles, uh, a little bit more. Um, and what you discover is their titles have highs and lows. They have ups and downs. You know, they, they hit, and now with streaming and all of the different little niche, niche, genre, genre, you know, all those different things that we can have, those little places like documentary network, you just stream, or whatever that, horror movie, you know, whatever those specific, black, black and brown people that work, where I'm, Putting out, you know, black exploitation movies and making them, you know, making them relevant and talking about them more. So you can never tell. Like, I've got movies on my little streaming thing that I'm pushing out there to being streamed. They're public domain now. So somebody let those rights go, but we're as individuals are still making money off of it. So the IP a property like that, as long as we are still consuming media. As long as you've made something and you keep it updated and whatever, it can continue. It may not ever make its money back, but it always can make some money. Even if it's $13 a month or you know, a quarter, or $10, five cents, 10 cents, whatever it is, it can still make something.
You know, it can still like on a hoop, um, you know, the, the library screening thing where they're paying 88 cents per screening, you know, Redemption will get like, you know, 10, 10 of those and that's $9, you know, and then it'll be on Roku and it'll get $39. It's a 20 year old movie that never really made any money. I still make a little bit of money here and there. I believe if I live long enough, I may see today what it may be. <laughs> and, it, and, and it has a chance. You never know. Brian White could blow. One of the people in the movie could blow. I could become a bigger director and people would want to go. There's so many things that could factor into any lifetime of a project that it's never worth just abandoning it 1%. Do you pump money into it? No. Do you maybe put make sure you put some posts up in your social media if it's on Tubi? You know, make sure you're posting it's on Tubi. Make sure that you're, you know, that maybe every once in a while, maybe you do some new art on something, just like how the big ones do. You see that you do the same thing. It's not that expensive to freshen up your art and give yourself a chance to maybe have people discover it in a different way. It's a worthwhile investment. So those are, the, you know, those little things of how you can kind of maybe write a new description of it. Maybe try to find a way to post it in what I've gotten better at lately is finding new groups on Facebook that you can post things on, you know, where you can find new fans. That's what it's there for. What are those groups there for? To talk about the things you would talk about. Well, there's black exploitation groups. Well, there's black independent film groups. There's independent film groups. There's, you know, genre specific Hong Kong appreciation, all the different types of things. So you have opportunities to breathe some life into your projects by just doing a little bit of research that you know, with you put all that time into it, you might as well see if you can get it to make a little money now. That's the way I think of it. When do you let the LLC go and and relinquish it? I usually about a year, year and a half. I usually try to avoid if you can try to avoid paying taxes on it and just let it dissolve. You know, let all the if you if you've gotten all the business done of the project essentially then you can assign that to a different thing. You just have to kind of make sure that you're designating how you're designating it through a different company um, because it still has to be to that film, obviously. But at a certain point, it's not really conducting business. It's just a property that's being sold and bought and sold. It doesn't need to, you know, be able to write checks except for the people that it owes money to. So by, an, by via accounting, which it, so it needs to be able to pay an accounting fee, right, and have somebody pay it out. So you don't necessarily then have to, and I forget how it works because I'm not the tax expert, but you know, essentially that entity doesn't necessarily have to pay taxes anymore after it has existed as a thing. You know, you don't have to pay taxes 30 years later. I don't have to pay taxes on redemption, right? Like I can make whatever that little money and yes, I have to pay, but they're, they're earning on that for it. They're not looking to collect off of those taxes from that 30 year old entity, essentially. If it goes up, Yes, absolutely, they'll look for it. But they're not going to look for it because it's an old property. It's essentially an old property that you're just earning off of. And there's no way for them to tax it except for the tax that earning and to tax you. So you have to pay your taxes off your earnings, right? 